Good afternoon, everybody. So we, we will convey, uh, we con we'll convey the audience to a, a journey into um, thematical cartography, critical and radical cartography. Uh, radical view on, uh, on the world is starting, uh, has started already in the eight, uh, 19th century and early 20s. And um, we will start by um, a presentation of what is uh, the so-called isotype which has been invented by uh, Otto Neurath, and uh, I will let Neptis presenting what is the, uh, the, uh, the isotype. Uh, Neptis is a journalist, and she has written this book, which is called, in English, Social Engineering of Otto Neurath. It's only, unfortunately, in French, but this is um, uh, a basic, very important book, which is describing the thinking, the thinking and the philosophy of Neurath himself. So, Neptis, please. I'm very glad to be here because my impression is you are all inheritance of Otto Neurath. When you hear the name Otto Neurath, you, you think about isotype. It doesn't work? Yes, too far away. I hate it. Uh, okay. And when you think about isotype, you think of pictograms. Pictograms. Like this you all know, or like this, the following one, you recognize. And when you know what the acronym ISOTYPE stands for, International System of Typographic Education, you may think of the system behind. And if you know Neurath developed it with his wife, with his wife, you may think of Marie Reidemeister too. So it's only to remember, to remind, there were two, him, Otto Neurath and Marie Reitermeister, we often forgot. Um, but isotype is far more as an iconic or pictographic system, and it's not even only an international language, as Otto Neurath said. It, is, it has a political purpose. There is a po political purpose behind, and if you are an historian like me, you are amazed about what happened before isotype and before build statistic, the ancestor of isotype. Mm. I would al also say it's a political statement for Otto Neurath. Uh, I, I will be very quick because it's a, a huge subject. Mm. Everything started long before the Gesellschafts- und Wirtschaftsmuseum, the GVM in Vienna, the, the museum he, Otto Neurath, ran between 1925 and 1934, where he developed the system. It started uh, during the First World War. Uh, at this time, Neurath was in before that, it, he was in Leipzig, then in Vienna, and he worked in museums and developed the first systems of visualization of economical um, facts. Uh, these, these first panels are lost. We don't know anything about that. They were first attempts of visualization. But what happened in November uh, 18, 1918, he was in München, in Munich, and there he was involved in the revolution. He wasn't... Uh, revolutionary, but he was here as an economical uh, expert and he tried to implement his view of economics uh, in the revolution. So he's, um, he's an um, national economy, he's a, an expert of economics and he, he did a lot of, um, he went to the Balkan region and had a lot of uh, expertise of how, how wars, uh, um, the, how are the effect of war on the population, on the society, on the economics, and wrote it down. And he felt as an, um, he referred to socialist utopists, French socialist utopists, to anarchists, and um, felt himself as an, uh, he said, I am an utopist, but a scientific utopist. 
And I will try to propose uh, new ways of having economics to the society. And he said, I am a Gesellschaftstechniker, a social engineer. When the, the revolution broke out, he was in Munich and he was involved with Kurt Eisner, uh, Erich Mühsam, Ernst Toller in the um, uh, Münchner Räte Republic. You translate it with a Soviet Republic, but it's wrong. It's not a Soviet, it's a rate, it's a council republic. And that, uh, he, he tried to develop an economic system, a centralized administrative economic system. <laughs> yes. Um, showing showing an, a new way to, to run economics because he was anti capitalistic and anti-liberalism. And as a lot of economists were at this time before, before the First War, we al always forget it, but we had a lot of people like uh, Max Weber, who were very critical to the uh, capitalistic and liberal system. It, of course, uh, the, the experience of the river, the, Bavarian Revolution was very short, it lasted uh, one month, not more, and, uh, it, um, and these plans were not ex never implemented, of course, um, and it, it, uh, it led directly to jail, and he had to leave Germany, and in 1921 he came back to Vienna, and there the Austro-Marxists the social democrats uh, run the, the, the city and he started working with them. So from this moment on, uh, he engaged in the, um, on the side of the workers without being a Marxist. He was never a Marxist. He knew the theories, but not very well. He had a Marxian point of view on the evolution of the history, not more. But he could work hand in hand with the Austrian Austro-Marxists. And there he started to develop the, iso the isotype. They, he called them first uh, Bildstatistik, only Bildstatistik. And the purpose was to change or even influence the social order and maybe the course of the world by representing correctly social and economical facts and the hidden, the hidden interrelations between social facts must be shown and they must be accessible for everyone, even for the workers. So, and as everyone should understand them, here, one of, they must be as simple as possible. Tu peux revenir, Philippe? Merci. Here you have one, a first example at the beginning. You have this, I, this build statistic, the, uh, the signatures, but with a lot of ornament. And slowly, there were, uh, yes. Uh, all ornaments disappeared and the system emerged no. and was he? Yes. Till you have here in a very, um, one of the final aspects of the isotype. It looks, looks like that. So we should never forget behind isotypes there is all this process, this political purpose by Otto Neurath and uh, you can implement it in Red Vienna. Red Vienna in the Austro-Marxist uh, uh, Austrian city. No, at all. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> so wh wh one of the reasons, it's, it's really important to have, uh, to really give a tribute to Neurath for several reasons. First, because he really shown all, all along his life that data and representation of data, they are political. He, he does something political. Also because with a lot of generosity, he's, he was uh, guided all his life to uh, create a visualization system which is accessible to all. Uh, uneducated people, illiterate people, people which are working all day long, 12 hours as worker, and they are very tired, they have to understand. 
he really wanted them to understand, to have access to economic uh, information, geopolitical information. And uh, Neurath with his wife, really both of them has done a tremendously huge work, which is a great insp a daily inspiration for most of us today. So this legacy is important because if you look around on visualization, on infographics, there is a lot of uh, Neurath-like inspired uh, work and he's not always quoted on this. So um, all the, the, <laughs> the, the people which think like us that Neurath is one of the really our uh, master on which we rely and we, we, he's a source of inspiration. Uh, we should never for forget to go back to Neurath and to re-deconstruct uh, his work to see how genius it was and how we daily use in our work for deconstructing as well as constructing map the work of, uh, of Neurath. So thank you very much for this uh, reminder. And uh, there is this, um, uh, this book that uh, Neptis wrote, it was just issued one month ago, um, uh, Otto Neurath and the Social Engineering in French. Um, Luckily, there is tools today, automatic translation tools for those who are not speaking French, but it's really a, a new masterpiece in the, in the Neurat, Neurat uh, research. So now, I'd like to invite you to um, a little journey into cartography and come back a little bit on history of what is radical or critical cartography, how, we, how it came and um, how we used it. For myself, I said, uh, making maps as a map maker with conventional uh, visual representation mode protocols and uh, methodology came out to be extremely boring at the end and very frustrating in the sense that you maybe represent the world and you all had uh, b yeah, school books with maps in it showing uh, f flux of uh, or transport of oil from Middle East to Rotterdam or to New York or to Japan. Uh, and the question is, what are those images bring to us? We know that, we have this image, but actually it shows very little of the world. Uh, reminding Elysee Reclus at the time, end of the 19th century, 20, uh, beginning of the 20th century, Reclus, this uh, well uh, famous uh, anarchist geogra geographer, was extremely upset about seeing all those maps so descriptive and so meaningless. And he, he really, he started to hate those maps and he wrote a, a text where he, he preconized, he, he's just asking everybody to destroy the map, to burn them, to, to get those maps out of school because they are totally useless and send the, uh, the students and the pupils on the field to discover the world and to understand how systemic is the world. He's really one of the first geographer which has shown this, the, the, the system is, uh, how the world works in a very complex system and he was dreaming about uh, creating systemic maps. But at that time, surprisingly, uh, with his colleague Charles Perron, he didn't manage to find the visualization representation mode to describe this very complex world, but he wrote it very well uh, because he left wonderful text where uh, you, you can feel this complexity very well described, but he was just unable to visualize, so we had to wait uh, a few decades before other geographers and cartographers would be able to uh, manage uh, big data uh, a package and uh, try to clean this and show a little bit uh, to make at least visible what was invisible. So you know that the, the, cartograph the cartography claims to be um, an exact science based on reliable data uh, and a conventional map maker he prides himself to create a very neutral, faithful image of the reality. This is the first thing, but this is disregarding the fact that the map is really the logo of a country. As you see here, this North Korean painting exposed in Vienna uh, five or six years ago. Korea is one, and for the North Korean, as well as the, as the, um, the narrative of the, the, how the Koreans are rewriting the, the history, the peninsula, this is one country, and they are, they have, it's very difficult for them to draw the border. And there is a whole imagery behind this showing this fact that the representation of the country, the form of the country itself, is extreme, something very holy. It's a state thing. Misrepresentation of a country in some of the countries uh, is the same thing as to burn the flag or to uh, mistreat the flag, and uh, you get blame for that. Uh, for example, Morocco, Greece, Saudi Arabia, Iran, uh, for the toponymy, 
and, and those countries. Uh, Morocco, it's obvious because there is a whole part that they have uh, annexed uh, uh, f 40 years ago, and uh, uh, there is sanction. If you misrepresent Morocco without the Western Sahara, then uh, you get censored in the country. The second thing is to, to recognize the country. And this is where the political aspect of the map comes. Uh, you have your map, you have an intention, and behind this intention you have an, an idea of what a country is. Uh, and here it is looking like very uh, obvious. Now uh, we have also to develop an old uh, system collecting data to prove that, to prove this fact. This is the intention, but we have to, uh, to show why this is uh, this statement and what in the, ge the world, the, the geopolitical uh, system, you have one super mega power and we will uh, show some few examples. When we talk about uh, this um, a critical approach of cartography, it's very much linked to um, the point of view, where you stand. And uh, after all, uh, you can uh, you can draw a document, a map, a graphic, which, which says one thing and it's complete opposite. It's extremely easy, you know, I can prove that to you uh, right away. And there was um, a, little, uh, uh, a little promotion film from, uh, from a very famous English newspaper. I don't know if it works here. Which shows what means a point of view. And uh, I decided to show it to you today because it depicts exactly what is mapping in a political way. What is, what is the uh, uh, mapping uh, in, uh, within the context of the radical geography or the critical geography? An event seen from one point of view gives one impression. Seen from another point of view, it gives quite a different impression. But it's only when you get the whole picture, you can fully understand what's going on. So I would encourage you to, to buy The Guardian, then you're sure you have all the point of view. But this is fundamentally, it's, it's exactly what it's all about. Uh, mapping. Uh, politically or mapping uh, thematically is nothing else than that. Uh, as we have been evocated uh, to Neurath with Neptis, uh, we can also start by uh, saying that we work with statistics. Um, some times ago, in the, in the 30s, Neurath has been uh, committed by Stalin and uh, the staff of Stalin to create a visualization bu bureau in Moscow in the early uh, 30s, 1931 32. And that was very simple. That was the, the time of the first plan, 29-34, and the second plan, 34-39. Uh, and uh, Stalin thought it's, it's good that we implement, uh, we, we start um, great uh, infrastructures, enormous dam and canal and uh, enormous industrial site. It's good that we do, and the Soviet people do it very well, but uh, we have to market them. We have to make it known, because no, if nobody knows it, then it's not worth doing, <laughs> doing those. So he has done two things. He went to look for uh, Gorky, which was in Italy at that time, and he asked Gorky to come back and to lead an army of writers to write about. He sent all over the Soviet Union and to write books about uh, the great dams and the great infrastructure, like, for example, the, the, the writer Paustovsky. And those books were printed by millions, millions of copies. Uh, we can be jealous because when we sell a book, it's only three or 4,000 copies, and at that time it was like 10 million, 20 million copies. And he, the second thing he asked, he, he was aware uh, that uh, visualiz uh, the, the visualization of the economy was great, so he asked Otto Neurath and uh, another fam fa very famous uh, Soviet um, uh, designer, Elisitsky, together, they were good friends, the couple were good friends, to create uh, an office called Isostat where they would draw graphics and maps to show how great Soviet Union was and how great uh, Stalin was doing with the implementation of the first and the second plan. And all this was done in English and in Russian and in English because this atlas, it remains two copies today in the world. Uh, one is in Geneva, one, another one is in New York. Um, was um, intended to be shown at the, the International Fair in New York. 
the Soviet pavilion in New York, so that they could see how good and how well the, the Soviet Union would do. And I, I have extracted two figures of uh, this um, atlas that have been, uh, I've been in Geneva and I took some pictures of it, I couldn't scan it. And the, one, the first one, Otto Neurath was given statistics. He didn't collect the statistics himself. <laughs> he was given the statistics and he was kind of skeptics after a moment because it was a little bit strange. Like this one, the liquidation of unemployment where from uh, 1928 to the yeah, mid of the first plan when he went from 1,500,000 to zero unemployment, which was a great achievement, of course, for the... Soviet power and represented this as a graphic. And you see it's so easy because you, the graphic is striking and nobody is going to, to confront him or to challenge uh, the figures. Anyway, at that time, if you were challenging whatever, you were just disappearing from the surface of the earth. So it was not uh, possible. And the second graphic extracted here was also something which is looking like serious statistic. This is the change of population between 1913 and uh, uh, a date which is uh, a little bit before the uh, uh, Second World War, where you see the, the change in structure of population, and here you had the bourgeois population, this what so-called bourgeoisie, which completely disappeared here, and also this peasant uh, uh, part of the population, which is completely transformed into either workers or either employees. So, and it was also based on, on true statistics, and those figures were uh, going around the whole Soviet Union, all the communist um, uh, part of Soviet Union, and uh, thought as believed. So th this was under Soviet Union, it was in the 30s, but today, let's think a little bit on, uh, about, when you think about manipulation, is that happening today? Is that happening today? Without us knowing, because we are not necessarily very familiar with the, the things. So maybe you are swallowing things and say, oh, wow, the unemployment, oh, look uh, how it is uh, when you look a map of Israel, Palestine, really awful. And uh, maybe you're completely manipulated and com maybe what is uh, shown to you is something which is absolutely far from the reality, if not a lie. So, uh, Yeah, of course, uh, speaking about Israel-Palestine, this is very clear. Uh, I don't even sh need to show a map because it's a question of terminology. Uh, mapping or cat cat cartography as such is, uh, is such um, powerful that you can use both for uh, uh, revealing what is um, discrimination or unfairness. It's a tool for the resistance. Uh, such as those resisting against uh, discrimination for social justice, etc. But it's also a, a very powerful tool for the powers, for the countries, which could use them uh, extensively. And they, uh, they have also lobby which are imposing those maps very uh, heavily. And it's very clear that if you browse to internet and you Google, for example, uh, Israel-Palestine map, there is a, a large chance that the 21st occurrence, you will have a map of Jerusalem and Israel uh, denying the, the existence of a certain uh, communities and naming, for example, some area within Jer East Jerusalem, which is formerly and internationally recognized as Palestinian territories, Jewish area or Jewish quarter. It's very neutral and it looks like they have always been there. But in, if we follow the criteria of the international law, you should find illegal Israeli settlements according to the 242 of the Security Council. This is something very different. You can't be neutral, you can't be objective. This is not possible. You have to do either or, and either or means there is no in between. You have to, to choose. And this is just one example and we could reproduce this as, as, as thousands. Now, um, coming back to uh, Radical cartography, I want to make a little um, abstract on, a uh, little bit historical abstract on, on, on what it was and what it is. Uh, for me, diving into the radical cartography was working in two phases going in the field and deconstructing what you see. The first phase is really an act of deconstruction. The cartographers 
which says they are counter-cartographer or radical cartographer or critical cartographer. And now we see appearing the expression of experimental cartography. We experiment, we try things, and if it doesn't work, we go backward and we do other things. Uh, we deconstruct space and social phenomena, casting aside convention. So those, uh, uh, of course, and it was not geographer, we were the f which were the, the first one to do this. That was artists, militants, urban planners, architects. There was no geographer, surprisingly. But the project has proliferated. Uh, for example, in Argentina, United States, in Switzerland, in Germany, in France, in Norway, where I'm living, uh, on thematics such as finance, surveillance, security, marketing, too much. Uh, control too much, uh, video camera too much, environment, administrative division, harnessing powerful tools such as participatory cartography and social network. And the aim here was to reveal hidden processes that contribute to appropriation of public space, appropriation of uh, institution, um, and, of course, undermining uh, individual freedoms, that's the most important. Um, some of the projects is uh, about hijacking of uh, leg legislation. So, deconstructing, informing, showing is the first stage, and this is what we have here. Actually, I'm following since like 10 or 20 years some of the people working here, uh, and I see clearly that sometimes there is uh, a little bit more. This phase one, deconstructing and showing, is already something. But it's probably not enough because at uh, the time of uh, social network, everything is so ephemerous. You show some things, you say, okay, France is selling uh, arms to um, Saudi Arabia and they kill children in Yemen. This is obscene. This is a huge scandal. And maybe you will tweet that on your account and you will have thousands of retweets. And the day after, it's, it's going to be forgotten. So this is the reason why we have to do something more than that. And in, uh, in the domain and in this uh, extremely uh, nice and sympathetic uh, world of uh, radical cartographers, extremely informal, I'm not even sure there is a Wikipedia entry by which, which says radical cartography or critical cartography, what is it? Which is good because then, uh, <laughs> then it's not administrative or it's, it's, it's not becoming institutional so, so fast. There is this phase two, which is the uh, action on the field. Uh, maybe some of you know the, the, the work of Trevor Paglen. Trevor Paglen has, uh, and this is an example, I want really to, show, to explain to you what I mean by that, and after we, we, we switch back to uh, some of the projects uh, we were uh, leading with the, our team. Trevor Paglen decided like 15 years ago to monitor movements of planes. And those planes were planes chartered by CIA or FBI all over the world at the time of the war against terror, and namely uh, uh, trying to get people, they, they made prisoners, or they arrested in Pakistan, Afghanistan, for example, or even Somalia, or the, all the places where the Americans were uh, acting and having intervention. And with a very huge network, so it's really typically the very successful participatory mapping action, uh, with the help of a lot of people monitoring in the airports, landing and taking off of those planes, taking the number. Surprisingly enough, also in the United States, everything is public, so you have a number of a plane, and there is a website you can go and you know that FBI or CA has chartered this plane, which was taking off from this place, landed to this place. And uh, what Trevor Paglen has done when he was gathering those, those thousand uh, information on an Excel site, he managed to, to do this map of the secret flight of the CIA. That was the first time. But when that was not enough because you produce the map, but that's all. It's published and it's a, a, a little number of people, it's microcosmic, very number, little number of people seeing it. This, this was not enough. So what he decided to do is to rent two or three big uh, 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 advertisements panel uh, in the regions of Los Angeles, uh, blow the map up there and uh, showing, uh, call all the TV and all the media so that he could do uh, an event. Uh, and this has been teared down by the FBI, so it has happened like the American way, 40 cars, woo -woo -woo, and then arrested, uh, he was arrested, uh, and then they, they didn't know what uh, exactly he was doing. But that was too late, that was broadcast, and several weeks later, the program was stopped. So this phase two has been working here very well, 
in the fact that he has worked tremendously well to deconstruct the things, and he managed to make it public and to make, to make it an event of real action on the field so that the things could stop. And this is what, in my opinion, that I would give my personal opinion of what is this uh, uh, counter-mapping or radical uh, mapping or critical mapping approach, phase one, phase two. And I see here, especially when you reclaim the street, when you reclaim the space, when you reclaim the right uh, to decide on, uh, on the communities what you do with, your, uh, uh, with, with the land where you're living, to recover some sort of sovereignty, this is exactly the same things. And I see that in Canada, I see that in Brazil, it, it happens to be successful, not every, not every time, but there is a huge hope. I, I have a, a, a huge hope that this is, um, this is possible. Uh, the other, uh, so that was the, this uh, Institute of uh, um, Applied Autonomy in New York, which uh, also in the years 2000, have been uh, uh, launching also a counter mapping uh, system here and they were uh, very annoyed by the fact that there was more and more video camera so they decided to plot uh, each single of the camera with their orientation and to create some pathway from south to north Manhattan which were completely video camera free and they have found out that there was customer for buying such a map uh, which are, for example, the, I don't know, uh, the one who wants to go and buy some uh, little bit of marijuana discreetly, uh, the people which are black and are systematically arrested by the police that needs to be a little bit discreet, uh, women also uh, which uh, uh, have the absolute right to not be watched through camera by a perverse uh, 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 officer, etc. You, we could say that this was anecdotic, but this, was, uh, this um, a project was also really in the right, in the absolute right uh, uh, tendance or uh, event of what is radical cartography, gathering a, a large number of people, so it's a huge effort, and this is where we are very powerful, it's the number, and the number of people makes that you can gather primary da data of a very, very good quality. This is experiments, this is experimental. Just think that out of those two experiments, the Trevor Paglen experiment and the Applied Autonomy Office experiment, just, just out of those two, we could imagine what kind of other experiments uh, on, on which other uh, application we could, uh, we could um, implement this uh, application. When in a city there is too much video camera, too much control, too much control of the police, etc. Uh, and uh, of course, the, um, this is very huge. It's a very huge um, uh, potential. But we have to be extremely well organized and uh, uh, very uh, grown up, so to speak, so that everybody is aware of its own responsibility. And you, we know all of us how uh, things can go wrong when we, we work in a group. Uh, so we have also to be extremely aware uh, of what we do, and this is a huge, uh, a huge self-discipline, so to speak. A part of this, there is another, I, I want to quote here another uh, collective uh, from Argentina, Grupo de Arte Calajero, because they have also done, uh, they have created maps which were showing where members of the former military dictatorship in Argentina were living in a very peaceful retirement, hidden in a complete uh, impunity of what they were doing, killing people, throwing people from helicopters. And they thought uh, that was not fair. So uh, a decade later, they have really worked a lot to find out those people, and they, but that was not enough because when they say they, they are th there, they are living here and here and here under false name. Nobody moved. So what they decided to do was to organize touristic tour within Buenos Aires, and during the night they were putting some signs, exactly like you have in front of Eiffel Tower, or monuments, uh, with the CV of the, the persons, and they took tourists, Japanese tourists, whatever, and then they were doing tourist tour by bus with the people getting out of the bus, taking picture of the of the villa, etc. And uh, that was the action. And they have, of course, uh, marketed that and uh, asked the media to come and to see. And they managed somehow to alert the government, which were obliged. They didn't have the choice 
to trial some of those people because it was too obvious and they had the evidence and the proofs, which uh, some of them has been after uh, uh, condemned and are still in jail today. So again, phase one, a very serious work, credible work in, in academic, yeah, in the academic uh, terms, uh, so to speak. But very serious work, very well uh, documented, and then act, action on the field, which is probably the most uh, tricky and the most uh, uh, difficult to implement. Now, I'm here because um, I have contributed to, the, uh, to this book, this wonderful book we, we got yesterday, as, uh, with an, an, another project, which we called Duty Free Shop, and I wanted to uh, in, yeah, to give you uh, the update on what has happened on Duty Free Shop project started in 2007 when I was traveling with my family and my son, which was uh, two, ye two years old at that time, 2008. While suddenly um, we went to, as we usually go and take a plane, uh, our plane, we don't know how because we are against uh, consumption and against marketing. In my family, it's uh, since uh, <laughs> since the beginning, so we are really actively trying to fight against this. And somehow we and I don't know how it happens that in this airport, Christian Sound, where we take the plane in South Norway, we ended up in the big duty free shop, where my son, without seeing uh, we seeing it, were uh, grabbing a Chanel 5 uh, perfume bottle, uh, which is probably 500 euros or 600, put in his pocket. And we went in the tarmac of the plane where he was. <laughs> and I find it really strange, strange enough. And I, we managed when, to see when we were in the plane that he grabbed these uh, things. And we were just horrified because it was a lot of money. And I thought we will bring it back. But the plane took off. And when we arrived in Oslo, I thought, fuck, we don't give it back. Because I understood, that we were, we, I understood what has happened, that we, we have been put pushed into this shop without our will. And this is how the whole duty-free shop has uh, started. So we took the airport as, a, as an experimental uh, space for, um, uh, for implementing this uh, research project. And the airport because, so you can always say, it's only 10% of the population traveling. So this is a, an anecdote. Yes, I agree. But what is happening in the airport is an experiment led by people because this is a closed space, secured space. Uh, and we thought at that time that what was happening, the process happening within the airport would happen in the public space. Uh, railway station, uh, supermarkets where, or, or shopping mall, or uh, even now, uh, more uh, dangerously, streets are privatized. Uh, square, public square, are, are also privatized, etc. And they are, it's privatized along the same protocols and the same modus operandi as what they have done in the airport, as, uh, as, as an experiment, I would say. So uh, here we are in this airport, which is su supposedly uh, serving um, people as a uh, public service. It's a place where you go and then you are org organizing the infrastructure to transport you from a point A to a point B. This is what it is. But as you see here, they have implemented some really other uh, way of doing it. The first thing was to, uh, to mix your mind and to implement a system that we call fusion-confusion, making you thinking that uh, the, uh, the, um, the goal of transporting people is exactly the same of the goal of making people shop, like the new normal, something which is totally abnormal, be become normal, and uh, they are working very hard for this. Like this image show that in the, the, the logo tip, the letters are exactly the same. So that, and you can always say yes, but not me, because me, I, I, know, I know what is the difference between traveling and shopping, but at the end, uh, even the aware people, they, they forget this and they accept that. They don't even fight against this. They don't, they don't ask for the public uh, uh, corridor anymore. They just go through the shop because this is like that. So how, how is it? How, how, does it how, how does this work? Uh, I was speaking about um, deconstructing the, the space. Uh, now I want to show you how we work physically. When we are on the place, how do we work? How do we deconstruct the place? How do we observe things that, uh, and we are, we pretend to be professional, so we see things that the, the other passengers or the normal uh, uh, 
uh, Homo economicus doesn't uh, ne necessarily see. So let's be in an airport where you have um, a setup. On the left hand side, this is the public space. On the right hand side, this is the shop. This is a situation in a date. Let's say uh, we speak about 2008, for example. And you see that there is already a first space grabbing of the shop because they put the cashier just a little bit outside. So this is, uh, this is already an int uh, they intrude the public space. But um, six months later, they have done this. So they took the cashier and the shelves and they put them a little bit more into uh, the public space. And they withdraw some chairs and they withdraw the fountains where you could drink for free, for example. The observation, this is a, the observation which is both geographic and temporal. You have, and this is what is difficult, and this is why you don't see it, because the change occurs very uh, slowly, because they want you to be used to, to you know, the change. And when you get used to the change, they go to the, the step further. Yesterday, uh, we have been uh, uh, walking for one and a half hour uh, around the Bayerischer Platz, and I really recommend you, if you have not done it, you, you really should do that. And this is the same. And here there is two artists, I, I don't remember the name now. They have created uh, pla uh, plates, like signs, like road signs. And uh, they have put it uh, two and a half meters on the, the electric plots. And they are each 200 meters. So you really have, it's an artwork and you have to work for one, two hours to see 50 of them. On each of those plates, you have all the anti-Jewish law from the Nazi period, starting 1st March, uh, I don't know exa when they, exactly when the Nazi won the election, in March 33 to uh, 1942. And it's very uh, interesting, and I was not aware of that, it's, it's very clear how uh, very slow they were uh, in uh, emitting those law. At the f in 33, 34, they are uh, preventing Jewish people to do things which were almost nothing. And you think, okay, yeah, maybe it's fair, maybe we, uh, we can cope with that. And then it goes more and more uh, weird. But you, you got used of the one before, so it becomes normal. And then you get until 38, where um, uh, the law be become completely obscene, but they are accepted as such because you have been used uh, you have been psychology prepared before, and in an airport, it's it's uh, is the same. So here, this is this is the setup, and we observe that. A few weeks later, they have a drone here within the public space, dashed red line to guide the to guide the the flux of people, and this is what the terminal is looking like from the other side. And you see from here, the perspective is that it's completely busy with the cashier in the shell. So they have hijacked 80% of this public space and they have uh, withdrawn almost all the chairs so that the people, they are obliged to stand with the kids uh, there. This is what the um, uh, entry of the duty free shop is looking like from the door where the passengers enter when they uh, when they get down from the plane. And you see, it's also again, it, they, it, they are guided by lines. But they managed to, and here you go to look for your bag, but it's before entering things. But it was not enough and they, could make, they couldn't put a fence or a barrier. So what they did, they asked um, an employee from the airport to stand here and to guide the passenger. So he's standing here with a colleague, and when the passenger enters, when you see the authority, remember an airport is a secured place and you don't, uh, you don't break the rules, you don't over, uh, over rules. And it's, you know, the, the luggage, it's that way, showing the way of the shops. And according to my um, uh, contage, uh, uh, when less than 50% of the people were entering the shop, with this new setup, this is 80%. So it's, so now, now you have done the observation, the, there is a phase 1.1 is to draw the things to show how it is on the space, and this is always important, making visible what is this invisible structure. I'm a little bit sorry to be uh, uh, so precise, but this is the place here to show the process, and maybe uh, some of you can implement this process <laughs> and this methodology and those protocols on other projects, who knows. 
This is the airport, this is where the plane is ending, this is the duty-free shop, and this is the luggage. So this is how the things happen, and this is a door. People get out of the plane, and they go to this door, and here it's already 100 meters. And why not here, to go directly there? Then, they are asked here by people to go into the shop, either they go in the shop, either they go here, and then after they would go to the, to the, to the back. So this is uh, the prefiguration. And then the phase two would be to alert, the, to publish this and to alert the press and the media and to make, a, uh, uh, to make an, ev an event right at the airport to invite the to stand here for example with placards and then to invite the people to say no don't enter the shop because you will, you will be pushed against your will you have to go some in some other place we have done it in, in oslo they have closed the public corridor and we have uh, organized an action uh, they were very upset we've been arrested by the, the the guards but as the newspaper and the tv was there they were a little bit cold feet and they reopened the the corridor at the end uh, which was what we we call a success was the, because now this corridor still exists and still coexists together with the private space so this is how um, how we we work in this in this observation but this is possible only because of that because uh, the red is becoming an authoritarian state. As soon as you enter the airport and you get into the, the security, there is many things you don't have the right to do anymore, which you can do in the other place. And because you are in an airport and you board a flight, this new country, this new authoritarian country, superimposed to our countries and uh, uh, has its own rule, and because this is a secured area, because this is, this is a restricted area in terms of, of freedom, uh, they thought they could do with you whatever they want. So this is, this is it, and this system is now implemented in many railway stations in France, in Latvia, in uh, Great Britain, for example, and also in Norway and Sweden now. Few, few more examples, how uh, you work, now we are, we are a little bit more technologic, but at the time that was the first uh, observation, the airport of Copenhagen where you go through the security and then you arrive here in a place which are security check and you're in a place with a corridor which would lead you to the public space but you are obliged to go to this duty free shop for 257 meters. And here you have two doors and it's very funny because in small, uh, I don't have the picture here but it's called, this door is exclusively reserved for people which have allergy to smell. Because, of course, you have the perfume and the, the things, and it smells very, very bad. Uh, but they said, if, if you are not allergic to smell, you, you, it's forbidden for you to go that way. You don't have the right. You have to go through the shop. And I found it so, so uh, extremely sweet, in a way, because uh, they are playing their own games. They are, they are believing their own uh, lies, so to speak. Uh, I should, I will. The, the picture will be part of the published project, of course. But it works, when I, w when I was saying also, we were obser observing how uh, they were trying to uh, confuse f the fusion confusion. It's also, um, when you enter this space, you don't have clocks anymore. You don't have, uh, you know, the, a clock which, which would show you what time is it. You just, just have um, red lights, uh, yellow lights, things which is very uh, sens sensual uh, in a way and they tell you you're just entering a world of desire and needs, and this is the place where you can really be completely crazy. In Vienna, at the entry of the, of the, the terminal, there is even two sex shops. So you, you are with your kids, and you have one shop, it's called the Seventh Scene on the right, and uh, on, the, on the left you have Ulla, Ulla, uh, call Ulla, uh, with the, the telephone number, with the shops, with everything in the, in, in the, the vitrine. Uh, welcome, desire, needs, this is what it is. And fusion, confusion, because this is yellow and this is red, but you see that this is the only way you have to go, utgang in Norwegian means, that you have to go uh, through the shop. There is a complete fusion, confusion between uh, the way you are um, uh, asked to circulate in, in an airport, afgang, this is the departure, and you have to go through that. Um, few 
example, and this is what you will find in the book, and um, this is also the result of um, extremely painful uh, observations because you have to stay there for the full afternoon, you have to, to count the people which goes in and out, how they circulate, you have to also interview the, the, uh, the security people, interview the responsible of the shop, interview the responsible of the airport, um, and you get uh, a lot of um, uh, critics and a lot of um, uh, hostility, of course. So it's, I wouldn't say it's very pleasant, but I think it's extremely necessary to deconstruct this space. So this is the figures you find there. The situation in 2005, where you had really an extremely pleasant uh, public space with a direct access to the embarking gate and a and small beautiful shop where you could buy your salmon and your uh, pullover. But, um, the, <laughs> the benefit was very little and was too little, so they decided in 2006 to completely change the system and extend this duty free shop and make the people enter here, create a barrier of trolley and let only 50 centimeters. But that was not enough because still only 40% of the people which were, were entering this shop and the rest was taking this corridor because it was very visible and very obvious that uh, that was the way to go to the door. But then they closed this door and they were forcing the people to go all the way at the end of the shop to come back here to take their flat here. But that was not enough and in 2007 they decided to extend the shop again. And here, uh, according to my uh, statistics, uh, it was uh, depending days and afternoon and uh, how the crowd is uh, um, busy or, or on a hurry, uh, between 85 and 92 percent. So it's very good way and as soon as you enter this duty free shop it's it's clear that you will buy something especially because at the end when you get out somebody is asking have you bought something and you know how guilty you feel when you bought you enter a shop and then you had all those uh, girls and boys uh, very nicely um, serving for you a little glass of vodka offering a chocolate and you have the impression that you have profited of them and then it's fair if you buy a small something <laughs> there is there is a whole psychological uh, 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 system uh, behind which makes, and this is not an anecdote because between 2005 and 2007, if you look at the uh, uh, operational uh, accounting uh, within the annual reports, the, the benefit uh, when they implement a system where they close, they, they make disappear the public space to push the people in there is, is plus 300%. Uh, this uh, German, it's a, actually a German company called Henneman, uh, and uh, just the benefit, uh, this equal uh, the, the largest uh, international corporation. But it's not Apple, it's not Nike, we don't know their name, they, they operate extremely discreetly, but the level of benefit is equal to those very, very well-known and uh, 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 well-known corporation and well-marketed uh, uh, co corporation. So we were in Oslo and this is, this is how it is. And now this is, they were decided to close this uh, remaining uh, uh, pathway and this is very dirty. I don't have the pictures, but this is, w whether here it's red and, and white and uh, beautiful, you have the, it's really uh, uh, extremely appealing. It's exciting, you go in there. Here it's a gray, it's a vomiti vomiting uh, green. It's full of carton uh, and it's dirty. They don't clean it <laughs> so that you really don't want to go in there, although you, although you have the right. And they even uh, hide it with a panel uh, for a time, but we, we ask them to remove that at least. But this is, this is what it is today and it's even getting worse because with the new uh, things they have completely hidden, hidden this way. Uh, we are, yeah, we are in Berlin, Schönefeld, uh, so 2005, this, is, this was the security and then you go through the security and you go to board the plane here. But they didn't make enough uh, benefits so they decided to use the empty space here to create a huge duty free shop. They closed this door, which is a, a glass door, and then you were obliged to go all through the duty free shop. Did you buy something? No, but I take a chocolate plate and then up you go to your friend. And the, 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 between here and here, there is 300 meters almost. So you see, it's not, a, it's, it's not a, an anecdote and it's not nothing. Stockholm, security control, go to gate, that was not enough. We create a huge duty free shop, we close this door. 150 meters, 150 meters, and you go to gate. Bergen, the last one. Uh, I wanted to understand whether the system was just an exception or it was like general. 
you go through the security and you through the domestic terminal and if you enter the, the duty free shop 200 meters and you go to the international terminal and you board your flight to London or to Paris and here is a door. <laughs> you have done 357 meters while here there is five meters between the security where you could get. So it's just nothing is a for coincidence. It, it would look like um, an anecdote again, but uh, the idea behind that is really to, to put the people which have conceived the system, this, this uh, interior uh, uh, setting, in front of their responsibility to try to change. Now this is the phase one. We have done the work, we, we are showing it, we are uh, publicizing it. Uh, the second phase would be to do some actions to change the philosophy and the mind uh, behind and to come back to a real public service and a real um, uh, public uh, space or public territory use where uh, you could put people uh, in a little bit more friendly and more comfortable way before they are traveling. I, either this is in an airport or in a railway station. Uh, it's, it's about mobility and the mobility is important because uh, Although we have a climate change and we should be very, uh, very careful, we are moving more and more. But if we move more and more in a very uncomfortable way, uh, there, we consider this is a degradation of uh, our uh, well-being and, and, and what we do. So the model is as following this one. That was the model before. Fusion, confusion. Now it becomes this. We, we, go, we come from this to that, which is mainly, which is basically what happens now in most of the public infrastructure dedicated to transports of people from a point A to a point B. Here, it, this is a, uh, an airport, but it's, it's now also bus station and, uh, and uh, railway station. What happened to the Chanel? On the what? The model Chanel. We, um, <laughs> we have framed it. As a <laughs> so we never we, we never get it back, and I, I'm I'm keeping it very um, uh, very well. And when we will be publicizing, uh, it's going to be a book. There will there is there will be a little documentary. There will be a website dedicated to expect. We want pa passengers also to to um, to come up with their experience, but we they, they have to do it uh, when the website will be uh, will be up. Uh, for the book, we have been extracting a part of the research uh, which is uh, visible in the book and in, in the exhibit. And after we would like, uh, the idea is that we, I consider that uh, we have done our uh, job and now I would love that PhD candidates, that group of citizens, community, they, they are taking over like what happens in, uh, in a square of a city, which is, uh, uh, for example, the municipality, they are renting to private interest uh, the, the, the bank, the chairs, the public space, and then you, you cannot come with your picnic or your own bottle of water without being bashed by the, the owner of the bar, which has paid, we have paid a high price, etc. cetera. And uh, yeah, it's right in the, like in the movement reclaim the street. I would love that uh, really some groups is taking over and appropriate the, the DFS project to extend it. So that's, that's the plan for the, the near future. And the bottle of Chanel <laughs> can be a kind of, a, you know, you have always like a logo or something like that. So uh, the, it, it, can be, it, can be, uh, it can be this. So one other point. Um, yes? Uh, radical cartographer? A counter cartographer. Okay, we can think to apply. I was thinking about finding a, a visiting professorship somewhere. Uh, we had an offer for Singapore. Maybe um, <laughs> it could be maybe uh, uh, California. Why not? Thank you for the uh, the uh, information. Uh, now um, I was I was thinking about. Um, the map as an uh, identity of a country and how upset a country could be uh, when uh, they consider their country totally misrepresented. Uh, I want to stress now, you have seen what we have done with this project, that uh, those maps are, uh, they are political and they are very subjective. Uh, they are enough subjective for, for what we want to do because they show the situation in a way uh, 
that it's not shown by the, the map that you can find in an airport. You, you don't see the maps like that, of course, uh, stressing the, 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 uh, the idiotics where they are uh, organizing the things. Maps has, have, has power, and I would like to show here a few examples also on how, when we talk about uh, addressing um, inequity, uh, discrimination, uh, poverty, uh, wealth, uh, and when we say that there is poor people and uh, rich people, we all know what it means to be rich or to be poor. But what, we, what is more difficult to approach is what's the gap, what's the extent, and this is the uh, this is a, the thematic of another project that we have called Geography of Plenty, Geography of Empty, to try to make, to, to make visible uh, trends through statistics which are invisible. And, and I'd like to present to you one or two of the, uh, uh, of the examples. The first one is this one. And, and you will see also that we can work. We, we don't necessarily need to spend a lot of time to gather or to extract complicated or statistic or statistics which are confidential that you have to negotiate to get. You can really work with available statistics and with statistics which has, are as boring as the GNP per uh, capita. Uh, on, on the second example, so here. Uh, we wanted to respond to the idea that Europe is facing an invasion of migrants, you see? And this is in the, ra the narrative. All the newspapers, the European Union, the Commission is saying this is a threat on the European civilization. They are coming by millions, they are threatening our communities, stealing our wife, eating our bread, and we, we don't have the possibility to, uh, to welcome all the poverty of the world. This is just awful. We have to protect ourselves. This is a fantasm, of course. This doesn't happen like that. But this fantasm, which doesn't correspond to the reality, is extremely important to consider, because this is this fantasm, precisely, which is at the origin of the European policy. It, it is transformed into millions of euros which is spent to establish Frontex, which is the European police to, to uh, close the border and to, uh, to try to uh, retain the people at the border of what we call Europe, uh, uh, inside the Schengen, uh, the Schengen <laughs> not Schengen, but Schengen uh, agreement. So this is the narrative. Now we are radical cartographers. What we want to do, you want to respond to that. We want to show that uh, two things that, first of all, the policy implemented is based on the fantasy. It doesn't pass the test of statistics. And secondly, we establish those rules, and those rules are uh, damaging tremendously much uh, secondary migra migration and cir human circulation far away from Europe. And secondly, also provoking uh, one of the m most awful blood bloodbath in the Mediterranean, because you, you know that there is today between 30,000 and 60,000 people which have died trying entering Europe in, a, in an unsafe way, because we, they were prevented to do it by a safe way. So here, we just focus on the big circles, which represent here the, um, uh, the proportion of the European population, 500 million, 530 million people. And this circle here represents the highest estimate of migrants that have entered Europe between 2015, beginning of the so-called crisis, to uh, mid, uh, we go up to mid-2018. Less than 0.5% of the, the total uh, population of the world. So uh, these first figures means that, first of all, there is a lot of country that doesn't, uh, uh, that, that doesn't, um, uh, uh, apply the rules which are asked uh, to them by the European Union, but it means that we have the infrastructure, we have the money, we have uh, the possibility, we have everything to absorb even twice as this population. We, we talk about uh, maybe three million people, even if there were six million people, we would, it would be very easy to absorb them in a complete gray way. We wouldn't feel it. They would bring us money because if they work, so they fill up the social security uh, case, etc. So the discourse saying that there is an invasion and the, the, the civilization is uh, threatened doesn't pass the test of that at all. 
uh, and especially when the camera, uh, the video camera of, uh, you know, the, uh, the media are focusing on 2,000 people trying to, uh, to, to go over a fence. This is very spectacular, and this is the image we keep, but this Im image is nothing because kilometers on the other side, it's, it's happening nothing. Geography of empty, empty, geography of plenty, we have these other uh, figures, and, and this is, uh, I wanted to show that as a, uh, as a tribute to Otto Neurath, so to speak, because Otto Neurath was the most minimalist geographer, cartographer you can imagine. He very often, he said, I want three colors, three directions, and uh, three forms, and with that I do a whole geopolitical atlas. And he thought, more minimalistic I am, and more I have to take out of myself. The, um, uh, to be very creative and to find really the, the way to express the things so that everybody can understand my, my maps immediately. Here, this is as simple as possible. We took the indicator which is the most simple as possible, GNP per capita between 1970 and 2010. And we have been plotting on the uh, left hand side the 1 billion people, the richest in the world, or 1.5 billion uh, richest in the world, so this is half of the population. On the left hand side, the 1.5 billion of the poorest part of the population. So it means that you have here a sample which is very, very representative of the world. We could have been plotting. 50% um, of the richest population on, on the red and 50, 50 other percent on the, on the green. The image would have been a little bit less spectacular than this one. Here you would have probably a little bit more, uh, it, it would go up to this line like 2000, 2005, but not very much more. But for the sake of, uh, of the demonstration, I wanted just to, to take the, the, the half, half of the, 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 the world population. And to show here that when, when they saw that uh, the people in the newspaper said this is, this is a stupid graphics because uh, you see, uh, you, you, with your scale you show nothing. So uh, it's not worth showing it because we see nothing. <laughs> <laughs> so redo it, please choose another scale. And I said no, we don't choose another scale, we keep the scale because if we, if we change the scale then we cannot compare. They were not interested by the emptiness at all, they were interested by to see if here there was some like you can see here very clearly, you enlarge the height scale and you can possibly see if there was moments where there was some change. It's obvious that this emptiness here is here and all what is missing here is here and we speak about education, uh, health, etc. Sometimes here. But interestingly uh, enough, here you can see the crisis. And in rich country, and even here, also, you compare this to the narrative, 2007, they were saying this is the worst financial and, and banking crisis since 1929, and you thought the world would collapse. Uh, and everybody, and there was thousands of billions which were lost, uh, etc. It took one and a half years, and they started to recover. 2010, and today we are somewhere here. So it means that even though you have, a, you have like, a, a collapse which is enormous. Uh, even there is a stagnation for 10 years with the 96 crisis, for example, or the, the oil um, crisis in the 70s. It takes maybe four or five days for the world to uh, just stagnate and after, up oh, they recover immediately. Here they have recovered even faster and here they are recovering in the speed which is uh, also enormous. Geography of empty, geography of plenty. We don't say this is the final figures, but we, use, we, we, we like to use these figures as a base for the debate. It, we would like very much to have much more data, much more information that would come to explain this, but this is a base. And out of a figure like this, you can sp speak about history, what has happened with the colonization, what has happened with the neoliberalism, with the plundering of uh, the poor country, and the reason why uh, the wealth is so high at this place and so low at this place, where it, this represents the same number of persons. And so far, a person in the world is a person. I mean, a citizen is a citizen. So, uh, this is not an, uh, an end graphic that gives a statement. We like to, to uh, consider it as a base for uh, a debate. The same exercise applied to uh, the representation of the production of the world and what is speculate. And here, uh, among 15 years, this is the same story. This is the, G the GDP of the world. You have everything. GDP of the world, service, tourists, 
uh, third sector agriculture uh, industry. And you see that the, the scale is comparable, and here you have the money which is yearly speculated. Just imagine, 720,000 billion, and nobody in this room is able to understand this number, what it represents really. I, made, um, I took the Airbus A, uh, A380 uh, catalog price, and I calculate what it is, and then uh, you, have it, you have to buy something like 1.3 million Airbus, a three, <laughs> this big Airbus, the, the big plane, to uh, to arrive to the numbers of 720,000 billion dollars. So it's <laughs> just for giving you a reference. And this is, it's not the money which is capitalized. This is the money which is speculated each year, and it's even higher today, around the world. Uh, some economists uh, say that if you take 15% of this sum, 100% uh, of the world population would have uh, access to uh, s sanitation, 100% of the people would be uh, in school until the third grade, 100% of the world population would have safe water, 100% of the pop population would have access to a health center. Uh, I, don't, I don't need to say more. I would like also that those uh, very simple approach, very minimalistic, serves as, uh, as a base for the debate to be used and to be populated with other uh, issues. So, because we speak about finance, we had to represent what means these 720,000 billion dollars, etc., and to compare this uh, speculative planet with other planets. For example, this is the, G the GNP of the world. This is all what the households have uh, in the stock exchange, for example. There is some of them. But, and they are gravitating around. And look at this small planet. This is the estimate of the international criminality highest uh, estimate from the UN, international criminality, 1,500 million, the highest estimate. So the question, this kind of representation, so this is a geography of empty, uh, uh, we speak about criminality, this, it means human uh, trafficking, animal trafficking, rhinoceros trafficking, drug trafficking, arms trafficking, and we think it's enormous. But according to the estimate of the UN, I don't invent it, it's only, let's say, one thousand billion, but one thousand billion is uh, it's already uh, half of the, the GNP of France, so it's, it looks like a lot. But when you compare with the money which is speculate running around the planet or Lyon, it, this is nothing. And here you have financial criminality which is not necessarily integrated. There is a little bit integrated there. And, and you see, I'm just wondering, it's, um, I'm puzzled. To, uh, I'm puzzled with the, with the spread. And this kind of work, this kind of visualization is also meant for that, to be puzzled, to be angry, to make an angry map, and then to serve, to serve this map as a base for the... Another example here with this uh, representation, this is another project in America showing uh, that we... The research is, is uh, difficult to do, but we have tried to compare the hourly rate of workers which were uh, American workers and Mexican workers, uh, equal uh, qualification, ouvrier qualifié, as we say in French, uh, equal qualification, and uh, they work like on each other part of the border. So for equal qualification, for the same kind of job, this is, I don't know, there is maybe 200 meters in between, the, or 300 meters, or one kilometers at least, between the, the, the uh, maquiladoras and the American things. There is a system where here uh, workers would have $20 an hour, and here only 2 or two, $3 an hour, so ten, uh, 10 times less. Again, geography of empty, geography of plenty. The idea here is to show some things which is largely invisible. We, we know that they are paid less, but we have very difficulty to see how, how, how many less, I would say, they are. Um, and this kind of document is intended to do this. And here is a border which has to be uh, studied uh, in an anthropological way, uh, ethnological way, geographical way. Th this, this, uh, there is a lot of things that happens uh, around this border. Uh, lots of hypocrisy from the United States and uh, a not very clear game uh, from Mexico, but it happens a lot. And it's supposed to be completely closed, and each day millions of people are crossing it on, on each other parts. 
so there is exactly like in Melilla, Melilla, you, you know, this is this enclave which is uh, in, in northern Morocco, Sp Spanish enclave, northern Morocco, and it's fenced six times. You have six fence. Uh, the one is 10 meters, the one in center, and uh, there is a whole system, six fans, helicopters, drones, which are monitoring the things. Believe it or not, so it's closed, and six fans is closed, it means you shouldn't pass it. There is more than 50,000 passage each day daily, they pass this border, 50,000 times. You have the smugglers, you have the, the, the cargo women, the cargo people, you have the pupils, you have Moroccans coming in, Spanish coming out, etc. So it's also a paradox. Why, why, and like the Mexican border, why do you uh, close it? Why do you spend so much money to close, to build walls, uh, to have this policy, if this border is intended to be passed million times a day, or uh, thousand times a day? This is a, this is a question about, uh, but it's another project, but this is a, another very uh, uh, relevant uh, question for that. So within those two projects, we see here how um, we could use this alternative way of seeing, I would say, uh, an other way of seeing uh, the, uh, the things, which are not conventional. Before it's too late, uh, I would like to show you two, two other um, projects uh, to try to convince you of the other way of, uh, of, see of seeing uh, the thing. The other project is uh, also how you, you would qualify I think I have time for just one <laughs> with apologize, but I'll try to go to go fast. Um, again showing showing the visible or the invisible. What is looking like the geography of war? So we change the scale now, we go to, to a very, very easy, much more sm smaller scale. And the geography of war would lo look like something like that. And you see, the geographers, usually, they're nothing more they like that concentrated um, uh, event. The war, obviously, the war happens mainly in these regions. You, you have some places. Uh, in Colombia, where now it's going a little bit better, but there is this arch of war that goes from uh, South Africa, uh, Southern Africa, to uh, Austral Africa, to uh, India, and it's, you can pursue it a little bit in uh, Indonesia, there is also turmoil here. Uh, con and considering the, um, the sea of uh, South China Sea, and this Pacific Passat, which is very unstable, but it's mainly here. So. When we speak about geography of war, what we have in school books, what we have usually in image, that there is a world in war and a world in peace. It means that here it's basically in peace so far, here it's basically in peace, and in Europe it's basically in peace, in Russia, in China, there is no war as we understand the war is. Uh, we are just concerned by the fact, so there is different level here with open war, with tension, with frozen war, etc. I'm not entering in the detail for now. And anyway, you can find those maps on the website, visioncarto.net, everything is there and you can refer to, to this. Uh, obviously, uh, this geography of war has led of a uh, flux of refugees, which mainly, 90% um, of them, they remain in the neighboring country where they are coming from. So when we speak about an invasion of refugees or migrants, you see, the, it doesn't pass the test when you take this. In this context, there is less than 7% of the people which are trying to enter Europe or going to the United States or Japan or Australia. And Australia, it's even, uh, uh, it's even almost close to zero, and Japan, it's almost close to zero. So that, that it's, it's also a way to explain that it, it doesn't pass the test of uh, uh, the, the global approach from this. But if we come back to the geography of war, we were concerned by the fact that we don't have all the actors, and we, it's missing here um, a lot of actors, and the question is to understand whether this external intervention, if we can say with this external intervention that there is war in France um, in the country member of NATO, in the United States, in Russia, in Saudi Arabia, because they are directly uh, making intervention, violent, brutal, they are bombing, 
basically. Are they countries at war, or are they participating in the war, and what do we do with the things? Because they are main actors, you see? This is the first thing, and with what you do war, you do war with weapons. So let's see where the weapons are produced and exported. And funny enough, uh, very little of the weapons are produced on the place. So wherever you are in Africa, in Afghanistan, wherever, you use weapons which are produced either in Russia, either in Europe, either in the United States. There, it, it, there is the black and white, so this is the per perfect symmetry. And maybe we think that here we have a perfect image of the world at war. And we, the new vision here would be to consider that uh, the, the war is global. And I think I will, I'm, uh, I'm probably approaching uh, the, the spirit and the, the intention of Bureau d'Etudes about these global aspects because they are showing very well with, the, with their um, illustrations how tight, tightly trapped you are within a system that uh, is completely out of control. And this way of showing this in a, very, in a little bit more simple way is probably uh, also a, a way of debating it. But we, uh, we are hiding that, so we are trying to make visible something which is usually in the media or usually in the, uh, in the common narrative completely uh, invisible. The second uh, project, so I have uh, five minutes. I would like to, uh, to show you is also um, how how we could uh, depict and uh, talk about the human circulation in the world, how, how this happens. And we are, we are going to do it with very simple indicators, again, at the very global level. With this first approach, we, it's a project with um, the use of visa. So let's see, let's see what it is looking like. Uh, here, the legend is very clear. When it's very black and gray, the, if you are a citizen of this country, there is very little uh, other country where you can go without having a visa. And most of the time, if you apply for a visa, it's been refused to you, which explains that people which need to travel, if they are sick, if they need to have uh, uh, medicines or uh, special treatments, they are obliged to use alternative way of uh, traveling, which are much, much more dangerous than the safe way. So if you compare this map to this map, which is the Human Development Index, you see that there is a good uh, uh, correlation. We refuse the right to travel to people which are the poorest in the world. Now, let's see this, uh, this um, research project by Philippe Riviere, my colleague from Vision Carto, which he was also taking each of the countries, so this is also a participatory work, you need, because it, the, the, the database is uh, 192 countries with 192 times uh, the thing, so it's a really an, an enormous tab table Excel that you have to uh, collect, uh, control, and uh, treat at the end. And he starts by this map, the utopia of a world without visa. In this situation, from yellow, means that each citizen of each country can travel everywhere without having a visa. So the concept is pretty clear. And this, is, this would be the utopic, uh, let's say, uh, situation. We would, we would love uh, to have this situation. But now, showing this, you have to see what is the situation today. This is, this is the reality. This is what today happens. Uh, this is the country in black, this time, which deny the people to, to travel with a visa. So it means that to go to the black country, or to the very dark country, uh, they are requiring visa from most of the countries in the world. And more, it's clear, this is very free country and welcoming country. And this is very surprising, Bolivia, Mali, Iran, who, who would think that, uh, and some countries in Western Africa which are very welcoming because this is countries which requires almost uh, to very, very few countries to have a visa to travel, less than 10, 20, while uh, United States require visa for 160 uh, countries out of 120. So it gives another, an alternative view of the world, and this is what is interesting to us because you can reverse the, the narrative about the free world 
we can't say we are in the free world when we denied to so much people to, uh, to stay away from us. This is not possible to call us a free world. Uh, and maybe Bolivia is a free country because it requires visa for only few of the countries. And uh, even there is uh, uh, management which are pretty easy there. Other way to represent this, this is Switzerland. And this is how, it's very simple. Here there is a representation of countries with, which needs a visa to enter Switzerland and countries that doesn't need a visa. And we can uh, extend a little bit. This is where radical cartography helps us to wall the world. And we represent here a walled world because it's very clear, again, the geographers, they love concentrated uh, um, uh, uh, trends. And it's here. This is very concentrated because we could build a world, even though you have some small island here of friends of Switzerland, and here inside, and this is the poorest country again, where you um, don't need a visa. Uh, it's the richest country, I mean, in the, uh, in the poorest parts. But this gives another image of, of the world, which is challenging the image of freedom, of countries of perfect governance, and we cannot say we are countries of perfect governance when we prevent two-thirds of the humanity to, to travel and to have the possibility of this. And this is called the, the, this is, this is called the sanctuarization of the world, and this is one of the representations that we uh, found out uh, with those red teeth here, pushing back the people which are in between. Sanctuaries are in red, where we prevent the people to come in. But this is also um, on, an image on which uh, Dutch architect has bounced. This is the same map, but the perspective is different because he has found out that at the end we have an Atlantic Pacific system. So this is another way to view the world, which is challenging our vision, uh, which, which is basically a closed world. So this is, um, uh, at the end, a very brutal image because you have uh, an image which shows inclusion and an image with, with, uh, which is showing exclusion of the world. So this was um, about um, uh, what I wanted to um, uh, convey to you, this uh, various way of uh, treating cartography, or tr treating um, uh, information and statistics. I uh, wanted to show you how um, all what we can do with, ve with very accessible and simple information and statistics. And I, want, I wanted also to show you how we work uh, concretely on the field. And I think all of us are doing it uh, more in, in a very different way uh, with uh, our counter mapping project how we observe the landscape, how we deconstruct it, and uh, how we have to find the force to gather all together to act on the field to reverse, sorry, to reverse the system and to push back the powers when they very cynically uh, try to grab more and more on our, our freedom to move, our freedom of speech, our freedom to use the public space and, and uh, find a way to reclaim by peace and uh, right, of course. There's no question to... I'm not saying that we have to make a revolution against capitalism. Well, sometimes I think we should. But, uh, to, to, to use a peaceful uh, uh, way of acting to reclaim the space before it's too late and before we find normal to, uh, to send our kids in a school which would be in the middle of a shopping center. Thank you very much. And, uh, <laughs>